Stretching from the west coast to the east coast of the U.S. is a series of arrow-shaped concrete slabs, stubbornly resisting the forces of time. They're often in the middle of complete wilderness, far removed from civilization, and some are practically inaccessible. Conspiracy theorists might say these were designed by NASA to guide UFOs to nearby landing points. The truth is, we know exactly when and why these massive arrows were placed. Their story is intimately tied to the intriguing story of U.S. airmail. Welcome to Intrigued Mind, and in this episode, we're covering the early history of aviation in the United States and the wonderful pragmatism of its protagonists in laying out the foundations of commercial aviation as we know it today. 1903, a year you might remember from history class. The Wright brothers became the first humans ever to pilot a motor-operated airplane from the sand dunes of Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. The millennia-old human fascination with flight had just reached an epic milestone. The international reaction was limited partly because the brothers tried to limit information to the press in order to prevent competitors from stealing their ideas. But they had unofficially inaugurated a race to improve aeronautical technology and soar through the skies. Almost immediately after the Wright's triumph, observers took an interest in aviation and began to consider its potential for mail. Rail mail had been the standard since the mid-1800s, connecting the country through the sprawling railway system. As more pilots took to the skies and safer aircraft, flying greater distances and at greater altitudes, people considered the viability of planes for mail carriage more and more. But many more were skeptical. In 1910, the New York Times mockingly wrote that, quote, Love letters will be carried in a rose pink aeroplane, steered by Cupid's wings and operated by perfumed gasoline. When asked if airmail had a future, Orville Wright himself said, I do not think it will supplement the steamship and the railroad as a mail carrier because it will be too expensive. It would take a very large number of flying machines, perhaps a hundred, to carry as much mail as we now get in a mail car. The U.S. Postmaster General, Frank Hitchcock, thought otherwise. In November 1910, at an aviation event attended by senior government officials, he agreed to fly as a passenger on a monoplane for a three-minute journey. This is a small nothing to us now, but at the time, this was huge. And when Hitchcock landed safely, he said as he was climbing out, it will not be long before we are carrying the mail this way. That is certain. From that point on, the U.S. Post Office was committed to make airmail a reality. The first official mail-carrying airplane flight in world history was on September 23, 1911, piloted by Earl Ovington from Garden City Estates in Mineola, New York. The department received official permits for dozens more flights over the next few years, with ever-increasing distances. By 1918, the Postal Department had made such strides with airmail that Congress, in the face of stiff resistance, finally approved an airmail service between Washington, D.C. and New York with a stop in Philadelphia. After gargantuan preparation efforts, simultaneous inauguration ceremonies in Washington and New York were held for the opening of the mail service. Attended in Washington by President Woodrow Wilson and then Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Franklin Roosevelt. Planes from Washington and New York left almost simultaneously for the first leg to Philadelphia. The total flight service was scheduled to last three hours. The first plane departing from New York was a resounding success. The one from Washington, however, was a complete disaster. Until recently, experimental flights overseen by the Postal Department were exclusively flown by military pilots, some of them in reserve for military duty in Europe during the final months of World War I. In this instance, however, Lieutenant George Boyle was handpicked not by the military, but by the Postal Department. Boyle had just graduated from a Texas flight school and had no more than 60 hours of piloting time. Since these were the early days of aviation, with a limited supply of pilots and even more limited precautionary measures, Boyle seemed like a sensible pick. At the scheduled time for liftoff, Boyle couldn't get his plane to start. It was discovered his tanks were low on fuel and his departure was delayed by 15 minutes later. Then, he followed the wrong railroad line, got lost, ran out of fuel, and crash-landed 25 miles south of Washington. Two days later, the young pilot was given another chance to fly to Philadelphia. To ensure he was on the right track, Boyle was shadowed by his superior for 40 miles before peeling off north of Washington. An hour later, Boyle got lost again. He landed on a farm, obtained some tractor fuel from a local farmer, then resumed the journey. Sadly, he lost his way once again ran out of fuel and crashed near the Philadelphia Country Club. Luckily for Boyle, he made it out alive and the press barely picked up on his misadventure. And nor should he be judged too severely. Though an embarrassing moment in the early history of aviation, Boyle's epic failure just highlights the myriad problems which early aviators faced in the US. Early airplanes were nightmarish to pilot. Aviators flew in open cockpits in extremely unpredictable weather, 
enduring tornadoes, cloudbursts, and electrical storms, planes were flimsy with technical flaws repeatedly exposed by rain, ice, wind, snow, and extreme temperatures. According to pilots at the time, there was essentially a 50-50 chance of engine failure on any given flight. Although fatalities were not as common in the early years as they would be later, it was only because of the plane's small size, maneuverability, and slow landing speed. But as with Boyle, the risk of getting lost was enormous. There was no radio at the time, no satellite navigation, few aeronautical markers on the ground, and especially terrible maps. American states were all shown on different scales, and maps featured practically no topographical data. The only seemingly dependable tool that aviators could have was a compass, and even that consistently failed them. Also in serious need was a reliable altimeter. Pilots were forced to rely on their own navigational instincts, which could only be properly developed from substantial piloting experience. As planes began to travel faster, the risk of crashing into a mountain or something else grew substantially. The U.S. Postal Department needed to resolve all these issues, and fast, if they wanted to keep the service running. Despite the general success of the first airmail service, the American public certainly wasn't sold just yet. Airmail postage initially cost 24 cents per ounce. It was lowered to 16 cents in July 1918, then to 6 cents in December of that same year. Even so, rail mail cost 2 to 3 cents depending on the year, and the American public seemed reluctant to pay extra for a service that was only a little bit faster. To convince more Americans of airmail's viability, longer flights needed to be scheduled to better differentiate airmail and railmail service times. Enter the transcontinental airway. While great strides were being made in aeronautical equipment and map making, flight visionaries within the department were making plans for an airmail route connecting the east and west coasts of the U.S. The department soon secured funding for new routes connecting New York to San Francisco, stopping off at six cities, Belafont, Chicago, Omaha, Cheyenne, Salt Lake, and Reno. As the country became more connected and the price per ounce dropped to two cents in 1919, thereby reaching parity with the cost of first-class rail mail, air mail began to revolutionize the postal service. The service wasn't yet profitable, but it was clear that as it expanded and underwent rapid technical developments, it could make air mail the future of postal service in the U.S. However, even with better planes and near parity of cost with rail mail, not enough people were committing to air mail as a faster alternative. It had to become even faster. There was one major obstacle, and that was flying at night. If flying during the daytime came with a host of problems, flying in complete darkness was essentially a death wish. The government initially sidestepped this issue through flight service by day, rail service by night, repeating in this manner until the post reached its destination. This system operated for three years between 1921 and 1924. The average time for coast-to-coast -coast mail was 72 hours, compared to the week-long duration of rail mail. But for the visionaries and government, it wasn't enough. Night flying had to become a reality, and the solution was the transcontinental lighted airway. This involved a system of beacons and landing fields across the entire country, and the cross-continental airway was a lit-up beacon for nighttime flyers to see where they were going. The first stretch was from Chicago to Cheyenne, covering 885 miles. The Postal Service built landing fields every 25 miles, each marked by 50-foot towers with revolving beacon lights. The pre-existing regular fields were also equipped with beacons, visible for up to 80 miles. Between landing fields, flashing gas beacons were installed every 3 miles. And those concrete arrow-shaped slabs? You guessed it. They were built too, right underneath beacon towers, painted in fluorescent yellow to guide pilots and literally point them in the right direction. On some sites, the rusting tower still stands above the arrow. Planes were also provided with luminescent equipment, navigational lights, and parachute flares. The initial project of the Chicago Cheyenne Airway was expanded throughout 1923 and 1924 until cross-country nighttime service was officially opened in 1924. Beacon towers were built every 10 miles along the 14 airways making up the transcontinental route, with the fluorescent arrows right underneath. At every third beacon was a landing field. With this system, the duration of coast-to-coast -coast aerial mail dropped from 72 hours to roughly 35 hours, including 15 stops. By 1926, the official privatization of U.S. airmail meant that management of the lighted airstrip was transferred to the Department of Commerce. The system was enlarged and more airfields and airports were built. By 1929, there were over 4,000 airports and landing fields servicing airmail in the U.S. The system made airmail a revolution, but with the advent of radio became less and less important. Many of the towers were demolished for much-needed metal during World War II. 
while many of the arrows were either destroyed or had their fluorescent paint removed from fear that enemy planes could use the arrows to navigate the US. However, parts of the system survived until the 1960s and an even smaller sum remain active to this day, particularly in Montana. While the US government was laying out the foundations for US airmail, it made spectacular advances in aeronautical navigation and directly impacted commercial aviation. Today, the digital age has practically made airmail redundant, just as it did to railmail in the 1930s and 40s. By the mid to late 70s, airmail as a separate class of domestic mail officially ended. For decades, post that bore airmail stamp was a symbol of prestige. Today, it is taken for granted. The milestones of the aerial mail revolution are largely forgotten today. May the mysterious concrete arrows scattered across the US be a bittersweet reminder of its momentous historic importance. For more videos on the most amazing forgotten parts of our history, be sure to subscribe to the Intrigued Mind channel, like the video, and leave your suggestions in the comments below.